One of the things that makes a great story a great story is when there's an ending that you didn't see coming. Esty story, that was not the ending I thought was coming. I don't know about you, I thought that was going to go a completely different direction. That's what makes it a great story, though. But as she was talking and she was finishing and the story took that turn, I really thought about this whole sermon series and what we've called it, Six Steps to a Generous Life. I don't know that we think about generous in our actions towards each other enough. Being generous and being gracious, being generous and being kind, being generous and being patient with one another. It's, it's in there. It's in the Bible. You'll, it's there. The importance of that, and this is part of this series. This is part of a big part of today, being generous towards one another and where that comes from. I was in, I was in Home Depot yesterday. Jen had sent me on an errand to get a caulk gun for her to use. I can't fix anything but a sandwich for the person who fixes it. So I, I got the caulk gun. I'm walking through Home Depot, and a guy sees me. He says, Reverend Porter, what are you doing in Home Depot? <laughs> it's a fair question. And his 9, 10, 11-year-old son was with him, and he waved and said, Look, son, this right here, this is, this is an original University of Georgia football fan. Did he just call me old? And he saw my face. He goes, no, no, no. I mean, he was a fan before they started winning. He was a fan when they were losing. They were doing all that losing. He was a fan even then. And I'm, I'm, struggling, with the, I'm struggling with the direction of this conversation at this point. I was like, how old is he calling me right now? And he could see the look on my face. I said, did you just call me old? He said, no, your sweatshirt. They don't make those kind anymore. Your sweatshirt is just old. They had those a long time ago. And I was thinking, yeah, he's right. Yep. It was older than Brendan, that sweatshirt. And I, I wear it to run errands to the Home Depot. Conversations, the stories that go a direction you don't think they're going to go, sometimes it grabs you. Sometimes it grabs you and it takes you to a place where you weren't expecting it to. That's what happens in this text in Acts. They had come together and they've asked Jesus this question, when will you restore the kingdom to Israel? You hear the question, right? We walked away from our families, Jesus. We walked away from our jobs, our careers. We walked away from everything to be with you. When's it going to pay off? When, when's it, seriously, when is the kingdom, when's the power, when are you going to be sitting on the throne, when are you going to be in charge of the day-to-day, because, -day? you know, we want to know. And you can tell a good rabbi, you can tell a good teacher, you can tell a good leader when they answer the way Jesus answered here. He answered by not answering them and asking them a completely different question. Did you catch that? Jesus does that often. He replied, it's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We read that, and we know that we're the ends of the earth. We read that, and we go, hey, that's awesome. Wish I could have been there to see that. But it wasn't till this series, it wasn't till working through these sermons and working through this text that this hit me for the first time. They had to be really disappointed. That was not the question that they asked. They had to really struggle with what happened there. Hold on, we're going to go where? The ends of, we didn't sign up for the ends of the earth, Jesus. We signed up for... We're, what? And then this really traumatic thing happens. Jesus gets whisked. I don't know a good word for that. He gets whisked up into heaven. And they're just watching. They're just, what just happened? It had to be a horribly traumatic experience for the person that you've been following, for the person that you think is going to be in charge of everything, for the person that you think is going to make everything right, to be gone. To be gone. That had to be tough. And a question formed for them right there. We'll get back to it. 
Let me ask you a couple questions here. How many of you grew up United Methodist? How many grew up something else? About half and half. The rest of the rooms were a little bit more Methodist, but that's pretty close, half and half. Being United Methodist isn't about being part of the institution. It's about being part of the movement. And the same question that those disciples were asking 2,000 years ago as Jesus is whisked, whisked into heaven is the same question, is the same need that we need to answer today. That guy, with him, with that son of God, with that lily of the valley, with that bright and morning star, bright and shining star, with him, how do we stay in a relationship with him? How do we stay close to him? How do we have a relationship with Jesus? Are you with me? Because this is important. That's the question 2,000 years ago. That's the question today. That is the essential. How do we stay in a relationship with Jesus Christ? And so knowing that, let me repeat what I said in the week where we talked about Bible study. May we be people who are concerned with deep roots rather than elaborately decorated branches. We say that about Scripture, and, and we get it right away. Scripture, we want to dig into Scripture. We want those to be the wells that feed us. But it's more than that in this movement. You notice I said movement, not institution or not church. It's more than in this movement. We want deep wells. We, we want to dig deep in these roots in the way that we experience the life, in the way that we experience the world. We want to dig down in our ability to reason. We want reason to be focused and to be guiding us. We want to be reasonable people, and we want to be able to reason our faith and go, why didn't he answer the question, and, and why is he gone? We want to be able to have Scripture feeding us and guiding us and leading us as we reason, and then as we experience as we experience God, as we experience this world, the absence and the presence, and we struggle, and then we want to look at tradition. We want to look for 2,000 years, what has the church done and what has worked, especially as we look at this question, at this essential question of how do we stay in a relationship with Jesus? How do we stay connected with him? Because you have traumatic moments as well. I have traumatic moments as well. We live in a world, we live in a, in a society, and especially in a time such as now, where trauma almost is daily. And how do we stay connected to Jesus? Being Methodist isn't about being part of the denomination or the institution. It was never meant to be an institution. John Wesley was not trying to form a church. He was doing a movement. And he was meeting the needs of the day. We'll come back to that. And meeting those needs, we recognize and know that anything great comes from meeting specific needs. Think back three years ago, almost three, I mean, two years and 11 months ago. Think back to the very beginning of COVID and what this community was like for those of you who were still here. And one of the very pressing, urgent matters where schools were closing and that they were going to be kids all around us, that was the only place they were getting a meal. They were literally not going to be eating because the schools were going to be closed. And you met that need. You said, not on our watch. We are not going to let kids go hungry. And through the Tillman Ministries, you gathered thousands, thousands of meals. It wasn't important that you partnered with businesses. It wasn't important that you partnered with city government. It wasn't important that you partnered with restaurants. What was important, or even other churches, what was important was that there was a specific need to be met, and you met it. That's what made it powerful. That's what made it unbelievably awesome. A specific need was being met. Around that time, the Cliff Jordan Continuing Education Center was forming probably the worst possible time in a hundred years for it to be starting, it started. 
And I remember having conversations with Donna and Coach about what was going to be happening and what was going to be going on. And, they, and Coach kept saying, education is the silver bullet. It's, it's great to feed these families. It's, it's great to be there for these families. And, and Donna saying, but we want to be able to give them life skills. We want to be able to, to come alongside. We want to be able to help them not just in the immediate, but we want to be able to help them long term. And so they began to do adult education classes. And one of the classes that formed out of there were for folks who's coming from other countries, who are coming from other places that don't speak the language. And immediately they started forming English as second language classes. Now remember, when did they start forming that? When we were all locked inside. But when there's a need to be met, great things happen. And now they're sitting at 80 and 85 students a week of folks who are coming, who are desperate for a place, for folks who are desperate to be able to build a life that you and I take for granted 98% of the time. If you want to see the Holy Spirit at work, show up in the Cliff Jordan Continuing Education Center when they're having the English as Second Language classes. You will see people who are not trained as educators, not trained as teachers, teaching people a brand new language, and you can literally see, feel, taste the Holy Spirit flowing through everyone in the room. And it's not learning a second language that makes it great. That's cool. That's awesome. It's meeting a specific need in that specific place, in that specific time that makes it important. Let me give you a visual. I didn't bring it with me, but you'll understand. When we had people... When people lived a long way from each other, 100 years ago, so let's go back 100 years. When people lived a long way from each other 100 years ago and they wanted to talk, what did we do? What did we do? We invented the telephone. And so now you can be a long way from each other. You can be across oceans from one another and you can speak to one another. We create, there was a need, we met it. So the need was met. The struggle was, okay, so I'm not at home all the time. I, I'm not home all the time. I, I, I travel, I'm in other places. So it's not just enough to have a phone in my home. I need to be able to access a phone somewhere else. So what did we create? What did we invent? So you want to say cell phones, but that's not right. We invented pay phones. Pay phones. And we used pay phones for years. When was the last time you used a pay phone? When was the last time you saw a pay phone? Because we all carry now phones, smartphones. When I first had one, it was a BlackBerry. I had a flip phone for about two weeks. It was, I hated it, and then went back to the BlackBerry, and now I'm like everybody else and don't use a BlackBerry. Because here's what happens. Over time, the question and need never changes. We wanted to talk to people that we weren't with, that were a long way away. The question and need never changes, but the answers do. The solutions do. Verse 8. Let me bring it back, please. How do we live out verse 8? We are the ends of the earth. How do we follow this Jesus? How do we do what is required of us to not only follow Jesus, but to help others be in a relationship with and follow Jesus. It's just the very next chapter that's Pentecost that the Holy Spirit comes down and breathing on and help. they're able to speak multiple languages. They're able to communicate with one another so that they can be prepared and equipped to go to the ends of the earth. How do we live out verse eight? Over time, the question never changes. Over time, the answer to meeting the need changes. So here we go. Over part, over time, when a way of life becomes part of the institution's culture, in time we need to develop a loyalty more to the institutional, excuse me, it's like I didn't write this. In time, we tend to develop a loyalty more to the institutional culture than we do to the original way of life. We become more loyal to the model than the mission. Let me say it again. We become more loyal to the model than the mission. The mission is always, always, always we are going to follow Christ. The model is this is how we're going to do it. The question never changes, but sometimes the answer does. Another visual. Couches. 
You don't have ugly couches, evidently. No, we got one couch sin, and somebody pulled it off of Facebook. <laughs> I think you're lying. I think some of you have ugly couches. You just don't really want to admit it. But we won't go there. Do you remember your grandparents' couch? Remember you'd go to your grandparents, and they'd have that couch sitting in the front room, and it was ugly, hideous. Some of us, some of us, I said us, not you, some of us had grandparents who had the same couch that they had when they first got married. And why did they buy that couch? Because they needed somewhere to sit, right? They bought that couch because they needed somewhere to sit. They had just gotten this little efficiency apartment, and he wanted to get a couch so that he could sit next to her. A chair wasn't going to do. She wanted a couch because he needed to sit down and quit pacing because he was driving her crazy. They wanted a place to sit. When they bought that couch, it was the perfect answer to the need of where will we sit. In time, they grew to love that couch. That couch is where they sat when they brought home their first child. That couch is where they sat every Christmas morning and opened presents. That couch is where they sat and watched the moon landing. They found out who shot JR on that couch. As a matter of fact, they are now watching the new Dallas called Yellowstone on that couch. There's a lot of history on that couch. When they bought it, what was the need? to have a place to sit. We need somewhere to sit. We gotta keep it clean. So what did folks do to keep it clean? They covered that thing in plastic. Am I stepping on toes now? They covered that bad boy in plastic, but at some point throughout the years, you moved out, and so they felt like it wasn't gonna get funky anymore so they could take the plastic off, but now you brought grandkids to the house and they're spilling juice and crackers and spitting up on that thing. They used to fuss at your dog when it got on the couch, but now that you've moved out and they got their own dog and their dog can sit on that couch all day long. Through the years, they've learned to flip the cushions over and it doesn't look as bad, but what are you gonna do with that smell? Everyone knows the couch should go, but they love it too much. At some point, someone suggested pillows, and now there's 15, 16 pillows sitting on that thing. The thing hadn't been comfortable for 10 years, but still, it's our couch. It's where we've always sat. It's part of the family. It's been there so long, family doesn't even see it anymore. However, every time guests show up, for the first time, they cringe and think, I will not be sitting there. Do you remember the need that it met initially? A place for us to sit. Eventually, your parents moved, and they didn't have the heart to get rid of the couch, and covering it was just too expensive, so they put it in the basement where guests wouldn't have to see it. And they answered the original need with a new couch. In house, in house furniture life, this is a silly illustration that we all understand because at some point or other, we've all carried around smelly couches. In church life, when we fall in love with our couches, it can be absolutely destructive. Churches all over our connection are full of ugly, nasty, smelly, and funky couches that have been scaring off guests and visitors for at least 50 years. If you're just starting to hear me again, I'm not talking about couches. I'm talking about who we are and how we answer the need of following Jesus and helping others follow Jesus. When we institutionalize the answer to this question, the day will come when it is no longer the answer. It is our nasty furniture that guests look at and say out loud, I will not, and my children will not be sitting there. When we fall in love with our institutional answer, we show that we care more about the institution than we do meeting the need of introducing the guests to Christ. Somewhere we have to question and challenge all of our institutional answers and me measure whether or not they are still answering the original question of following that man, that Savior. If you brought your Bibles those of you who didn't grow up Methodist, feel free to share your Bible this morning with those who did. Let's sit there for a second. 
we got Bibles in the pews. Revelation written at the end of the first century to seven specific churches. 100 years after Jesus physically walked the face of the earth, these churches are the epicenter of the Christian universe. 100 years. Go back to 1922. 100 years. That's all we're talking about here. 100 years after Jesus walked, talked, and taught on the face of the earth. 100 years. These churches are the centerpiece of what it means to be Christian life. The seven lampposts, the light to the world, vibrant and vital until they weren't, until they got smelly, they got tears, and they became more in love with their model than their mission. And in that context, the risen Lord says to the disciple John, write down these words. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands institutional, this is now me, institutional answers to that big question. I know your works, your toil, and your endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. Good job. I also know that you are enduring and bearing up for the sake of my name and that you have not grown weary. Good job. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from when you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What John is saying, what Jesus is saying through John, is we have to go back behind the institution and answer the original question. Your method and model cannot be above the mission. They at this point have forgotten their mission. And we know what that's like. We forget the mission sometimes. Can we own that? We're working like crazy, working our fingers to the bone, running as crazy as we can run, and at moments are just tired and frustrated and wonder what we were even ever doing. A couple years ago, seven, eight, nine years ago, I was talking with a lawyer friend of mine who was pretty burnt out. He was aggravated with his firm, aggravated with going to court, aggravated with the whole justice system. He said, I just, I just don't have the love anymore. And so I asked him, I said, well, why did you go to law school? And he said, I just wanted to fight for people who, who didn't have anybody to fight for him. I, I cared about the law. I, I cared about making sure that everyone was going to be represented. I, I wanted to protect. I wanted to defend people. I, I cared about it. And I said, well, can, can you go back to that? Can you go back to that? Can that be what you hold you again? Another place we lived, our next door neighbor was a middle school principal. Adored him. We were standing in the driveway having one of those conversations that neighbors have. He said, I am so sick of school. He was my boy's principal at the time, so it was a kind of a tough conversation. He said, I'm so tired of teachers and students and even more than that, parents. I'm so sick of the whole educational system. I just want to go home. I said, well, why would you ever become a teacher? He said, because I love sharing information. I love teaching. And in that moment when you impart wisdom and their minds open, you can literally see their minds opening. When I had the opportunity to teach, when I had the opportunity to offer, I'm a math guy. And when that student gets calculus for the first time, it's just awesome. I'll pay a 20 on the way out. <laughs> I said, can you go back to that? Can you go back to that? That is a gift from God for that voice to be in here right now with this. Can we go back to that? The reason that we did this is because we love God and we want to make sure that baby grows up. That baby grows up adoring God and knowing that they're adored by God. That everything that we do is so that we can follow Christ and that we can be a place, that we can be a church that will surround that baby with other folks trying to follow God. Can we go back to that? I'm asking, can we go back to that? 
We're focusing not on our past, but digging into our roots. John Wesley said, would to love that all the party names and unscriptural phrases and forms which have divided the Christian world were forgotten, and that we might all agree to sit down together as humble, loving disciples at the feet of our common master to hear his word, to imbibe his spirit, and to transcribe his life in our own. In another sermon, he said, though we may not think alike, may we not love alike. And I know what you're thinking now, because I think the same thing. Times are just tougher now. We're more divided now than ever before. Let me talk to you a little bit about Martin Luther and the 95 theses pounded on the door as the Catholic and the Protestant church split. Let me talk to you just for a moment about the English crown changing the rules and creating the Church of England and then them literally killing Protestant priests and having wars, wars, not arguments, not schism, wars over whether or not you were living out the right faith. James just rewrote the Bible. King James just rewrote the Bible. Calvin says Christianity is not for everyone. Scientists come along and say if the question can't be answered with science, then it just can't be answered. And into that, this young Anglican priest from the Church of England stepped in and said, there are smelly couches everywhere. Wesley said, I'm going to witness, serve, worship, give, pray, and study Scripture. His critics said, you are too methodical. And he said, yeah, we're going to be methodical in answering the question of how to be connected to Christ. It swept over the whole earth. It swept over the whole planet because one guy said, I'm tired of how that couch smells. Can we go back to the book of Acts just for a moment? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This movement that started, there's nowhere on earth that it isn't. Because we recognized that the institutional answers would no longer be enough. And they can't be. The method and the model can never come before the mission. So what are you saying, Derek? I'm saying we need to be a church in Smyrna and across the world that is focused first on the, meth- on the mission and not the method. We need to be focused in everything that we do and making sure everyone we come in contact hears our witness and experiences our witnesses as loving, faithful, passionate followers of Jesus Christ in everything that we do. Anybody here, don't, you don't have to raise your hand on this. Anybody here ever experienced church hurt? Church hurt? I have boys. The only church they've ever been a part of was the church that I was the pastor in. And my boys have church hurt. It's real. It's painful. And there is only one way, there is only one way for us to be able to protect that baby and the babies that come along with them so that they don't live through what we've lived through. Will you follow Jesus Christ faithfully in everything that you do? Will you put following Jesus and being his disciple above every and all things? Part of the reason that our couch smells so bad is because there are those who will say, if the LGBT rights and the LGBT doesn't become a real thing in our church, then I won't be a part. That's wrong. There are others who say, if anything changes, I'll fight it to the end, and if it changes, I'm out. That stinks. Nothing, nothing, nothing comes before making disciples of Jesus Christ. And in everything that we do, and in every place that we go, and every conversation we have, we tell people, Jesus loves you, adores you, gave his life for you. And I don't have every answer, but I have this one. The only hope for any of creation has been for 2,000 years, and until until we stand in that kingdom again will be the only answer there is. I don't have all the answers, and there's a lot of things that I don't understand, but I do know this. I will follow Jesus to the ends of the earth, telling people about him. As we come to the table, as we come to the table, 
If there's anything separating you from the love of Christ, lay it at the altar. As we come to the table, if there's anything this morning that is holding you back, that is keeping you from being able to follow Christ powerfully, leave it at the table. This morning, if there's someone that you're praying for, because many of you are praying for your brothers and sisters right now, for our brothers and sisters right now, that they may know the love of Christ. Commit here this morning, commit here today, that you will share the love of Christ with them and help them understand the power of following following Christ in everything we do. Let's come to the Lord's table.